Thanks, Rory. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honour to be speaking here, though it's a bit daunting to have to follow Anthony Grayling. Um, if God does not exist, can you hear me? You can hear me, yeah. If God does not exist, everything is permitted. Now, Dostoevsky actually never wrote that line, though so often is it attributed to him that he might as well have. And it's become the reflex response of believers when faced with the argument for a godless world. Without religious faith, runs the argument, we cannot anchor our moral truths or truly know right from wrong, and everybody would be able to pick and choose which values they accepted and which they did not, which is absolutely the case, but which also, of course, applies to believers, because pick and choose is exactly what believers do. Um, Leviticus sanctifies slavery. It tells us that if man committeth adultery, then both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. It instructs believers to chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. According to Exodus, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, and so on. Now, few modern-day Christians would accept such commands. Other commands, they would accept. And even today, some Christians reading passages in Leviticus of Paul, think that the Bible justifies the execution of gays. Others, reading the Bible differently, insist that practicing homosexuality is uh, no sin at all. And similarly with, say, the ordination over women, even uh, debates about abortion. Each side reads the Bible, or the Quran, or the Torah, or any other holy work, in the way they wish, according to the moral framework they've already got and brought to their reading. Belief in God, in other words, does not obviate the need for each of us to make up our minds about what is right and wrong. And even those who read the Bible or the Quran literally choose to follow a particular set of values. And yet, if Dostoevsky is wrong, or his misattributed quote is wrong, it does also tell us something fundamental about the anxieties about morality in the modern world. The sense that without being anchored to some form of ethical concrete, we will indeed be lost in a moral miasma. And interestingly, interestingly it's not an, uh, an anxiety that's uh, unique to believers. For believers, God provides that ethical concrete, that external anchor for moral values. But for some of the harshest critics of God, themselves have expressed a yearning for ethical concrete, an insistence that values must be anchored, not in a transcendental God, but in nature or in science. Uh, it's an argument, for instance, that someone like Sam Harris makes in his book, The Moral Landscape. What I want to suggest is that it's the very search for what I call ethical concrete that's the problem. Not because I think values are arbitrary or relative, but because what makes values non-arbitrary is not that they're fixed in some transcendental realm or that they're defined objectively by science, but because they emerge through humanity's collective judgment. And it seems to me it is loss of faith in our capacity to make such judgments that has driven, that underlies today's moral anxieties. Underlying such anxieties is not so much the death of God, but if we want to use a, a religious metaphor, the fall of man, if you like. In the Christian tradition, the fall, of course, comes with Adam and Eve's disobedience of God in eating of the fruit of tree and knowledge, an act that... Um, taints all humans for all time, corrupting their moral capacity, their willpower, and making it impossible for humans to do good on their own account. In the secular world, the fall, it seems to me, is the product of the post-enlightenment sapping of optimism, of disenchantment with the possibilities of social transformation, and of the growth of a much darker view of human nature. The um, Marxist-turned-Catholic philosopher Alistair MacIntyre 
once observed that ethics finds its meaning in a distinction between what he calls man as it happens to me, and I'm sorry, it'll always it'll be man rather than hu humans here because that's how people used to write. Man as it happens to be and man as he could be. Morality is like a, a map guiding us from the way humans are to the way we think humans ought to be. It is, however, a, a most unusual kind of map. Most maps helps you locate the starting point of your journey, the end point, the destination, and pinpoint the routes that can take you from one point to the other. Not so morality. On the moral map, the starting point, the destination, and the route are all created during the journey itself. Man, as it happens to be, is not a given. The understanding of what it is to be human, of human nature, has changed over time. And it has changed as a vision of what we could be has also transformed. The kind of being we can be depends partly on the kind of being that we are or we think we are. But a kind of being that we can be also paradoxically perhaps shapes how we see ourselves as we are. How we want to be, how we imagine we could be is also a way of, of, the, of us thinking about how we are in the here and now. And to understand that better, I want to look briefly at how moral ideas have changed over time through history. And in particular, the distinction between morality in the pre-modern world and morality in the modern world, because I think that's hugely important to the debate about morality today. In the pre-modern world, morality grew out of the structure of the community, a structure that was given. Societies changed, of course. You know, the Greece in which Aristotle thought, taught was very different from the Greece in which Homer had written. But few people entertained the idea that it was possible to will social change. Fate was seen as a social reality, and there was no evading it. So whether in the Iliad of the Homeric Greeks or the Vedas of Aryan Indians, human life was defined by the inevitability of death, the universality of suffering, the tragedy of being answerable for one's actions, and yet imprisoned by fate. And morality was about how to define right and wrong behaviours within a given structure of society. Every individual possessed a fixed place in society from which to derive his or her duties, their rights, their obligations. And moral rules derived from and would define his or her role within that community. From about the 6th century BCE, as what we call the heroic society, the heroic world, gave way to a more settled world, whether in Greece or in India or in China. So the idea of human dignity acquired new meaning. For Socrates, for the Buddha, for Confucius, for Motsu, the starting point of moral discussion was the idea that humans were rational beings. And reason was a means of finding answers to a world constrained by fate, an argument that Aristotle perhaps took further. It's interesting, if you look at the gods of the ancient world, they're very different from the gods of later faiths, such as Judaism or, or, or Islam or Christianity. They were not wise and judicious as the Christian god or the Islamic god or the Jewish god is supposed to be. They were capricious, vain, vicious, deceitful, immoral, and immensely powerful. And it was in part a reflection of how the ancients saw their world, messy, chaotic, largely unpredictable, barely controllable, and yet inescapable. And this was the tragedy of being human. But with tragedy for the ancients came dignity. Ancient gods according, acted according to whim. Only humans were truly accountable for their actions, Human life was framed by the gods, and yet humans could not rely upon them. They had to rely upon their own wit and resources. And it was human reason and human morality, especially for the Greeks, 
that imposed order upon an unpredictable world that carved out dignity and honour within it. Monotheism transformed this vision of human nature and the character of moral thinking. For the ancients, gods were constrained by the rational structure of reality. The monotheistic god, whether Jewish or Christian or Islamic, was all-powerful and constrained by nothing. He could act as he chose. Now, this new vision of God opened a new concept of agency and will. The unconstrained God created humans in his own image, supposedly as equals and as rational agents with free will. And this helped monotheistic thinkers, Christians in particular, to enlarge the meaning of humanity, the dignity of the individual derived not from his or her participation in a specific community, but through their God-created nature. But what God giveth with one hand, he taketh away with the other. Within the Christian, as within Islamic and Jewish traditions, the idea of a universal humanity was inevitably constrained by the very nature of faith. Equality was equality in the eyes of a Christian God, or a Jewish God, or a, or, 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 or a Muslim God. And hence, for instance, a long and fractious debate among Christians, well into the modern period, about whether non-Christians were equal, or even possessed souls. Other pre-modern traditions, the Stoics, for instance, faced no such constraints, and they had a far more revolutionary view than Christian or Muslim theologians about what it was to be human, about what universality meant, what, but what equality meant, a view that influence, came to influence many Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment thinkers. In a similar way, the Christian tradition developed new ways of thinking about the individual and about individual agency, just as it had developed notions of equality and universalism. But just as faith constrained the ways in which Christians could conceive of equality, so it constrained the ways in which they could think about agency or will. Will, in the Christian tradition, for instance, can only be understood in the context of the belief in the fall and in original sin. The doctrine of original sin, that we're all tainted because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, is perhaps the most original contribution of Christianity to the Western tradition. It's also its most pernicious. But the most important aspect consequence of monotheism was not a new set of values, because most of the values actually derived from what already existed, but a new reason to be moral. All moral codes possess two elements, a set of values to pursue and a reason for pursuing those values. The importance of the monotheistic faith is that they developed a novel way of thinking about the relationship between means and ends, the means of being good and the ends to which those means take us. Because the, the, the question was, why should I be moral? For a monotheistic faith, the end was God. God made the rules, and one followed those rules to the end. Why follow the rules? Because God tells us to. What the monotheistic faiths do is they collapse moral rules and moral ends. And so, in times of great social dislocation, and each of the monotheistic faiths developed in times of great social dislocation. In times of social dislocations, by collapsing moral, mean, moral ends and moral means, they found a way of saying, this is why you should do this. You should do this because God tells you to. Morality, in that sense, emerged less out of wisdom and reason, as it had been for many of pre-monotheistic societies, than out of faith, submission, and law. And monotheism made humans both greater and lesser than they had been before. Humans were created by God in his own image, and yet God and humans were now seen as weak, corrupt, flawed, 
broken. Where the Greeks had seen humans as carving out a space for dignity and honor within an unpredictable universe and in the face of capricious and often immoral gods. The monotheists, Christians and Muslims in particular, insisted that humans could not be good on their own, but only through God. Now, against this background, the emergence of the modern world brought with it major changes from about the 16th century onwards, brought with it major changes that transformed the language of morality. First, the idea that morality should be invested in God became less plausible. Not only did religious belief erode over time, but even devout thinkers, think of Kant, for instance, were less likely to look to God to set moral boundaries. There was also the dissolution of traditional communities. Social structures were no longer given, but became debated politically and challenged physically. Liberals and socialists, conservatives and communists, monarchists and republicans, all contested the idea of what constituted the good society. It was no longer a given thing. The concept of individual autonomy became far more important than it had been in the ancient world, where an individual's identity and interest was bound up almost entirely with the community in which he or she lived. In the modern world, the individual emerged as a new kind of social actor and detached from the specifics of their community. And the relationship between the individual and the community became framed increasingly by politics rather than morality. While ethics became less about fidelity to a God-given community than uh, 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 to a set of rules than about the individual making the right personal choices. And finally, there came a new distinction between the public and the private. In the pre-modern world, it was only through the community that the individual discovered his identity and integrity. So there was no distinction between the public and the private. With the rise of the individual in his own right, there was carved out a private sphere distinct from a public arena. And this distinction helped us redefine ideas of freedom and liberty, restrained the coercive power of the state, and, and, and made political equality possible. But most importantly, the recognition that society could be transformed and the emergence of mechanisms, social mechanisms for effective such transformation, transformed the meaning of morality. As people rejected the idea of society as a given, so ought, what ought to be, became a political, rather than merely a political demand. How society ought to be was defined by the possibilities, the political possibilities of social change and what we were able to do. And not just the meaning of morality, but its rootedness also transformed. The crumbling of belief in a God-ordained or order helped develop a new, radical, inclusive form of egalitarianism. The historian Jonathan Israel, in his wonderful trilogy, uh, his history of the, of the Enlightenment, makes the point that having dispensed with God, there was no meaningful alternative to grounding morality but in a generalized radical egalitarianism extending across all frontiers, class barriers, and horizons. Equality, in other words, was not simply the consequence of a particular moral outlook, it was also the grounding of a new moral vision. But it was a moral vision that was rooted in a kind of faith. Not the religious faith, but faith of a different kind. Faith that humans were capable of acting rationally and morally without guidance from beyond. It was a faith that drove enlightenment humanism and optimism in the 18th and 19th century. But through the 19th century, that faith too began to be eaten away. They developed a much darker vision of what it was to be human. 
as the optimism about human capacities began to ebb away. And the late 19th century experienced not simply a crisis of faith, what Nietzsche's called the death of God, but also the crisis of reason, the beginnings of a set of trends that had become highly significant, or became highly significant in the 20th century, the erosion of enlightenment optimism, a disenchantment of the ideas of progress, a disbelief in concepts of truth. Both these trends were, were expressed in the figure of Nietzsche. If Nietzsche was the high priest at God's funeral, he was also the chief celebrant at Reason's Wake. And it's brilliant at giving voice to the disaffection with both faith and reason would eventually make him a key figure in the postmodern assault on the so-called Enlightenment project. And the history of the 20th century, two world wars, the Depression, the Holocaust, Auschwitz, the gulags, climate change and ethnic cleansing has helped further shatter that old sense of hope and optimism about human capacities. Michael Ignatieff, the Canadian writer, politician, he observed that we no longer believe that material progress entails or enables moral progress. We eat well, we drink well, we live well but we do not have good dreams, as he puts it. And the consequence of all this, it seems to me, is that the relationship between what Alistair McIntyre called man as he happens to be and man as he could be has become obscured, indeed broken. The loss of faith in the human capacity to act rationally and morally and to collectively transform our world has narrowed the conception of what humans could be and confined our notion of what we are and it eroded the link between the two. Let me finish with a book by, which you may have read, by Viktor Frankl, called, published in 1946, called Man's Search for Meaning. Frankl had spent three years incarcerated in German concentration camps, including six months in Auschwitz. And he writes in his book, man should not ask what the meaning of his life is, which um, echoes something that, that um, Anthony Grayling said. Man should not ask what the meaning of his life is, but rather must recognize that it is he who is asked. The book, in a way, is a meditation on the experience of being in a concentration camp, of being in Auschwitz, a reflection of the ability of human beings to survive even the most degrading and tormenting of circumstances. And in the second edition of the book, there's a foreword by a rabbi, Howard Kushner, in which he says, this is a profoundly religious book. And it's not hard to see why you might read it as that. We have come to know man as he really is, writes Frankel at the very end of the book. After all, man is the being who invented the gas chambers at Auschwitz. However, he's also that being who entered those gas chambers upright with a Lord's Prayer or Shem Israel on his lips. And yet... It's a very different kind of faith that Frankel has to that embodied in religious faith. His book is not a hymn to a transcendental deity, but to the human spirit. Humans, he suggests, find themselves only through creating meaning in the world. But meaning is not something to be discovered. It is something that humans and only humans create. And we do so by acting upon the world. So Frankl writes, man is ultimately self-determining. He does not simply exist, but always decides what his existence will be. Which brings back to my original quest, the point about the relationship between the way we are and the way we want to be. The understanding of what it is to be human only makes sense in light 
of our conception of the kind of beings we want to be and the kind of world in which we want to live. It's the relationship between what McIntyre calls man as he happens to be and man as he could be. It is in that relationship that we discover the how and the why of morality. Because the human condition is that of possessing no safety net. And in particular, of possessing no moral safety net. No God, no scientific law, nor yet any amount of ethical concrete can protect us from falling off that moral tightrope that it is to be human. And that is why we have things like Auschwitz and the gulags. But that can be a highly, it can be a highly disconcerting prospect when we look back on the history of the 20th century. But it's also a highly exhilarating one because what it says is it's up to us. It's up to us to decide what to do with our lives, to define the values by which we live, to define the kind of creatures that we are and the kind of creatures that we want to be. It can be a disconcerting prospect. It can be an exhilarating one. Being human, it seems to me, we have the choice to decide which one it is. Thank you. Uh, five minutes questions, you said? Yeah, yeah fine. Did, did everybody hear that? Um, it was about China and wh wh whether in China they would see the move from a, a collective to an individual model of working to be good or bad is, is, is effectively what you were asking, wasn't it? It's worth, I think, to, saying two things about China. When, beginning with that Dostoevsky quote I had, that without God there, is no, um, uh, there can be no morality or anything goes... It's a very Western view of that, because China, for 3,000 years, they've had a moral framework, probably a tighter moral framework than we have had in the West, but without belief in God. Confucianism is a very strong, tight moral framework, but with no belief in God. So it's worth, if anybody points, suggests that you can't have morality without God, you don't even have to point to atheism to show how that's not true for 3,000 years. We've had that in China, a, a, a moral framework, a very strong moral framework, without a need for God. But this point about the shift from a collective to, a, to an individual point of view, what I'd argue is that there was no collective uh, 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 framework in China over the past uh, uh, century. Collective framework requires us as individuals, to work together in a collective to make decisions. The point is, in China, the mass of the people have had no chance to make those decisions. Those decisions have been made for them by a set of bureaucrats at the top, just as it has had been for the past 2,000 years. Um, so I don't think the, 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 there's, there's a shift from a collective to an individualist point of view. I think there's a, collective, there's, there's a shift from one form of bureaucratic rule um, uh, under uh, communism to another form of bureaucratic rule under kind of communism, communist form of capitalism, if you like. Um, but in neither case has the ordinary Chinese uh, uh, citizen had a, a, a say uh, uh, in defining what kind of country they want to live in. Yeah. Uh, just picking up from where she left off, um, China's often depicted as being um, interdependent. Um, and picking up from what you just said, it seems to me that China um, kind of remained quite um, dependent as far as the, the populace is concerned, and only the people that sort of tended to rule um, had 
anything in the way of power or the ability to make rules and change rules and so on and so forth. Um, whereas uh, in the West, you've had the, the populace um, and they sort of agreed rules between them and then um, once the population got so large that they couldn't agree because they weren't saying, seeing the same people day by day, suddenly God became a proxy for that. Um, oftentimes you hear people say that um, the East is in, interdependent and it seems to me that they're still dependent. We're trying to become independent as individuals and what we're ultimately looking for, and I think this ties back to what you said, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, we need to go from this group dependence to establishing ourselves as individuals to being able to be a society where we are individuals who recognise our own individual faults and strengths and share with each other on the basis of those faults and strengths. Well, we can't just live as individuals. I mean, we, we, we live as individuals within collectives within communities, and, and, and the trick is to be able to um, uh, exp express one's individuality through a collective uh, 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 form. Um, part, the, the pro part of the problem has been that we either think of ourselves as individuals or we think of ourselves as part of a collective or a group. And so the group comes first, or, the, or, 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 or there is no group. There's simply the individual, and, and, and the individual is all that matters. Neither of those can work. Um, uh, a, a society composed of a, a multitude of individuals is not a society. It is a, a, a series of individuals who, who have little interactions with, e with, with each other. Um, but nor can the idea that the group uh, um, in some way defines itself against the individual, and, 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 the, and the individual doesn't matter. The point is that you only find your individuality through society. But the society is only the, 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 the complex working through of our individuality. And it's, it's the relationship between the two uh, that matters. On China, and, and the difference between China and the West... I don't see it as the difference between um, interdependency and, and individuality. I think, you know, historically, the state has played in China the role that a church did in, 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 in the West. It, it has played the role of the guardian of morality, if you like. In the West, when the state, when the church no longer played that role, when the church crumbled, you had um, the, the, the beginnings, the makings of uh, what we call civil society, where we can ha we could have those kinds of debates about right and wrong, the kind of society we wanted, and so on. That never developed in China. The strength of the state meant that civil society never developed in the way it, it, it has in the West. And that's been the crucial problem um, in China. It's been the lack of development of civil society, and therefore the kinds of debates um, that we've had in the West has never really developed um, within uh, in, in Chinese history. It never, it, it didn't under uh, the old imperial rule. It didn't under uh, uh, communist rule. It isn't there today. Yeah. I'm gonna. Um, I want to ask a question about something you said um, right at the beginning of your talk, which uh, wasn't particularly. Uh, important in underpinning the rest of what you said, but I think it, it, it kind of made me um, think a little bit about uh, why you might have done what you did. And, what you, and you uh, mentioned the whole kind of picking and choosing morality kind of thing, and then you kind of said, well, that's exactly what believers do. For instance, uh, some Christians believe this, some Christians don't believe this, therefore, you know, it's much the same. And I think it's very important if you want um, those of a religious background to take seriously a non-religious approach to morals, then you're going to want them to listen to the uh, points and arguments of people who've actually, well, like yourself, who've actually put thought and effort into that, and differentiate them as from the people who are non-religious but also have put no thought or, or, or effort into an ethical system rather than just looking and say, well, some religious people think you should be good, other non-religious people are, you know, apathetic, other non-religious people are Joseph Stalin um, and therefore say, so it doesn't really matter, obviously, because they all think different things, there's no way of differentiating. Because that kind of seems to be exactly what you've done to them uh, by, by kind of putting 
someone, you know, a, a nut job like Pat Robertson, who along on the same kind of level in your discussion as um, hundreds of years worth of uh, in-depth Christian moral investigation. They aren't just equal. It's an it's not reasonable to just say because some Christians believe this, some Christians believe that, therefore it's all a bit moo and there's no real substance to it. Because you do have to be, well, a complete madman or have ulterior motives to come to the kind of conclusions about what the Bible teaches that, that have suddenly become popular in America in the last 50, in the last 50 years. R Rory to my ear, so I have to, I have to stop you there because um, I, I've, I've been told what I've got... 30 seconds, 20 seconds, okay, two okay. to answer. Let, let, me, let me just say, the, the point I was making was not that we should dismiss religious belief or, or, or religious people or religious morality. Uh, I, give, I, I make this, that, that point about pick and choosing, actually, to, and the last time I, I made it was to a group of theologi, the, theology students in, in Bristol. I, I give a, 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 an annual lecture every year. Uh, to a group of theology students at, at, um, who were training to be priests on why I'm an atheist. The point I'm making is that we all, believers or non-believers, have to choose our values. Religious people often say, you have to ch pick and choose, and therefore there is, your, your, your values are, cannot be grounded in something. Our values are. Our values are grounded in the Bible, say, or in the Quran, or in God's Word. My response is that, yes, my values are, 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 we all pick and choose our values, but so do you. You, as, 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 a, as a believer, also has to pick and choose. You have to make up your mind as to which values you believe in and which values you don't. There are uh, hundreds of values in the Bible and the Quran, some, uh, many of them conflicting, some of which people believe, some of which people don't. You know, for hundreds of years, witches were burnt, because people thought that that was what God told them to do. Now, very few people believe that now. But that's not because God has changed his mind. It's because society has, because humans have. In other words, people, and, and, and as I pointed out today, some people read the Bible today and think that, think that the Bible tells them that gays should be executed. Others read them and think that uh, there's no, no, nothing wrong with gays being, uh, becoming priests. So it's not that the Bible tells them one thing or the other. It's that people ha already have pre-existing views, and therefore they read the Bible in different ways. In other words, they pick and choose. And that's my only point. My point is that believers do exactly what we do, which is pick and choose. But we don't, of course, pick and choose values in a way we pick and choose shirts or cars or, 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 or apples. We pick and choose values in the context of collective decisions. Um, I haven't got time to do that, but, it's a go but, but, but my view is that values are neither objective facts in the world, in, 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 we can understand scientifically, nor are they arbitrary and merely relative, subjective. They are in between, and they're in between because they're humanly created, but in a, uh, but, but in a, uh, a collective fashion. And if you want to find out more about that, read my book. Thank you.